Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Simranjit Singh. Uh, I graduated from Trinity in 2006 um, and actually went and uh, did graduate school, got my PhD, um, and came back to Trinity to teach for a few years. And that had always been uh, my dream. Um, and so I'm so glad I got to fulfill it. Uh, I live currently in New York City and I do uh, fun things like teaching and running and actually now um, writing a book. So um, this is the new book, For Justin Keeps Going. I'm happy and excited to share it with you all. But first I wanna introduce uh, my mama. <laughs> uh, we refer to her as Mummy Singh. Um, and uh, a lot of my friends at Trinity um, called her the same. Everyone just called her Mummy as we did growing up. Um, and she's done a lot of cool things in her life. So I'll, I'll invite her to introduce herself um, and tell us about her story. Good morning, beautiful people. Uh, my name is Vinky Singh. I'm Simran's mama. And I was born and raised in uh, India and immigrated to USA in 1980. Like they say here in Texas, I wasn't born in Texas, but I got here as soon as I could. And uh, I have been living in this beautiful city for the last 40 years. We have four boys and they were raised in San Antonio and they're proud that they call themselves Texans. And um, our whole family is an avid Spurs fan and we love our Spurs. Thank you. And I, I just wanted to very quickly talk about my childhood um, and what, <laughs> what, what it was like. And, and I guess the point of it as it relates to this book is, um, you know, we were growing up in San Antonio. I was born and raised there. Uh, and didn't really have um, much um, much contact with people who looked like me. Uh, and then when we would look at media, um, and especially as a kid looking at children's books, never saw um, books that had characters that looked like the people in our family. And so I, when I was a kid, I vowed to myself that I would that I would write a book um, if one didn't exist when I grew up. And lo and behold, uh, 30 years later, um, my daughter was born and uh, started looking at those same bookshelves and, and nothing had changed. And so uh, that's when I went in uh, to writing this book. And a lot of it for me was driven by this feeling um, of, of representation and, and being, feeling, wanting to be seen by the people around me. So I want to ask my mom, and this is actually a question I've never asked her before. So um, I'm important for self, I'm excited for selfish reasons, uh, but also I, I think it's uh, fascinating for everyone. I mean, I guess the question is, what was it like for you um, moving to a new place, uh, not really knowing anyone, and then raising kids who looked so different um, in this unfamiliar place to you? How did, how did you address the lack of representation as you were raising your kids? And, and how did you instill the values of your culture and your tradition without any immediate support? Mm -hmm. Yeah, raising four boys in San Antonio that looked uh, different than a normal kid growing up there. Um, it was a big challenge in itself, but it was fun at the same time. When they were growing up there in San Antonio, there were no other Sikh families in San Antonio. And there were no books that we could put on our shelves with Sikh characters or pictures in them like Simran said it before. So I remember we used to drive to Houston, Dallas, or even Oklahoma, so that the kids can meet the other people who look like them. We used to organize camps at our home and the kids from different cities came and stayed with us for a week. I remember the first camp we organized was when um, Simran's older brother, Harpreet was only 15 days old and we had about 15 kids staying at home. And also we used to have people come stay with us for weeks to teach them about our faith and teach them the Indian musical instruments. And also the values and faith was our daily routine at our dinner table. We talked about our values and uh, what, what they need to do. So as they grew older, we still didn't have anybody that was their role models they can look up to. So my husband had a company, he hired about 10 young Sikh gentlemen 
with the same values and the, who look like them. So that Simran and his brothers have some role models. But you know, um, San Antonio is a beautiful city and very supportive community. That support was tremendous. There are two or three incidents that I can remember very clearly. One was when Simran was playing soccer, he was in high school, we went to Temple, a small city in, near San Antonio and Austin. And over there, the referee told him that he can't play with his uh, turban on. And you know what happened? The whole team walked off the field in support of the Simran's uh, values and tradition. And second one was when Simran's younger brother was playing basketball. Um, they were at a school and the referee said that he can't play. He said, coach said that he has played all his games, all his life, why can't he play? They said they need something in writing that he can play. You know what the coach did, he took out his uh, chalkboard and just wrote on there, he can play. So that, that was a great support. And the third one was, <clears throat> we were at a skating rink and uh, by chance, one of the school teachers had brought, brought her whole class to the skating rink over there. And uh, they were all skating. The manager came up to Simran and his brothers and told them that they can't skate with the turban on. The teacher asked uh, her class, that uh, if they would like to stay on the rink or they can go somewhere else. There were about 40 to 60 kids, the students and their siblings, they all came off the rink in support of Simran as a brother. So we had tremendous support from the community over here in San Antonio that we are very grateful of. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for, thanks for sharing all that. I mean, I remember I remember each of those stories actually, and we haven't really talked. I mean, even then, we didn't talk about them so much. Um, but I do remember. I do remember all of those stories. Um, I guess what we'll do now is um, is take a moment and read the book and uh, and and talk a little bit about, um, or at least at least show a little bit about what kinds of positive stories we can share. In in my opinion, uh, in my um, in my in my hopes. Uh, this book is very much uh, an anti-racist book. It's, it's a book that will help people connect with communities that they don't typically see and they don't typically think about as um, as being on an equal playing field, right? We, we tend to think of people as being um, inferior for, for a bunch of different reasons. And, and I really want this book to address that. Um, so here is the book. I'll share my screen with you um, and I'll go full screen. And it's called Foja Singh Keeps Going, the true story of the oldest person to ever run a marathon. Um, this is the foreword. Um, you know, the book is from my side dedicated to my daughters. Uh, the foreword is, is by Foja Singh himself. Um, and so if you, if you get a copy, you should definitely read it. It's, it's, a great, it's a great introduction to the book. It was a sweltering summer. Little Foja Singh sat under the shade of a banyan tree in his village in Punjab eating mangoes and watching the other children play. Foja was smart and funny. He and his friends liked to play cards and marbles while sitting in a circle and telling jokes. But Foja longed to join them when they ran and jumped. He longed to play hopscotch, to rescue a runaway cricket ball, or to run with a kite flying high across the sky. He wished he felt as strong as his name, which meant warrior lion. When he was very little, his parents worried that he might never walk. Month after month and year after year went by, but Foja did not take a single step. Aunts and uncles, grandmas and grandpas shook their heads gravely and said, it's too hard, he's too weak. But Foja did not listen and Foja did not stop. Instead, every morning he would listen to his mother who said, you know yourself Foja and you know what you're capable of. Today is a chance to do your best. Foja practiced walking outside his family's hut each day, staying in the mud to soften every fall. He practiced and prayed for months. He could feel himself getting stronger inside and out. 
Then a few days after Foggia's fifth birthday, a wonderful thing happened. He took one step and another, then another and another and another. Foggia Singh was finally walking. Foggia's parents were proud that their son understood what he was capable of and that he worked hard to achieve his goals. They were thrilled Foggia could walk because they knew it would make his life easier. His parents were so happy, they shared prayers of thanks and distributed prashad to the entire village. Once Foja began to walk, his legs needed strengthening. He practiced walking around the banyan tree every day. Some bullies thought his legs looked like sticks and they teased Foja by calling him Benda. But Foja did not listen and Foja did not stop. Though his legs were weak, Foja's spirit was strong. As Foja got bigger, it was time to go to school, but the school was miles away from his small village. There were no buses, Foja's, Foja's legs could not carry him all that distance, and they couldn't bring the school bus to him. So while Foja's friends went to school, he got his education on the farm, learning to plant, plow, and pick all kinds of crops. It's too hard, he's too weak, said the neighbors, but Foja did not listen, and Foja did not stop. He'd walk behind the buffaloes, planting seeds and getting stronger with each step. Foja worked and worked and worked. He walked and walked and walked. He farmed and farmed and farmed. And when Foja turned 15, the whole village witnessed a wonder. Foja could walk an entire mile. Foja progressed by leaps and bounds and he took many big steps over the next few years. He got married, he had children, and he even got his own farm. Foja loved his life in Punjab. He loved flying kites in the open fields with his children. He loved the excitement of a close cricket match played with friends. And he loved the joy that filled the village during the harvest festival of Visakhi. He taught his children how to farm just like his father had taught him. Every morning he would tell his children, you know yourselves and what you're capable of. Today is a chance to do your best. He cherished every step in his life's journey. As time passed, Foja's children grew up and moved to places far away. Foja, who was usually lively and energetic, grew sad and lonely, especially after his wife died. He missed his family and wanted to be with them. But to leave his village at the age of 81, to go live on the other side of the world, could Foja do it? His friends were worried. You're too old, Foja, they said. It's too hard for you to move away. But Foja didn't listen and Foja didn't stop. He knew it was time for him to take a step in a new direction. One day, Foja got on an airplane for the first time and went to live with his family in England. It was cold in England and almost everyone only spoke English. Foja was used to having many friends, but here he felt like a stranger. His family was busy with school and work. Foja found himself with nowhere to go and nothing to do. Foja passed his days in the living room, staring at the television. He had never been so miserable. As he was flipping channels one day, he saw something new. A whole lot of people were running around town. Was it a fire? An accident? No, Foja realized they were running just to run, and they all had big smiles on their faces. Foja knew at once that he had to try this. He put on his shoes, then walked out the door. He took one step and another, then another and another and another. Foja Singh was running. The wind flowed through his beard and for the first time in a long while, a smile appeared on his face. After that day, there was no stopping Foja. He began by running a little bit every morning. As he got stronger, he ran faster and longer. And when he felt especially strong, he would even run again in the evenings before eating dal and roti with his family. In England, it was common to see people running for fun, but not many of them looked like Foja Singh. Some people would stare and some would laugh, but Foja did not let that bother him. He ran and ran through the streets and parks of England, getting better and better each day. He ran races and he ran for fun. He ran with his friends and he ran alone, always with a smile on his face. Foja loved running. He liked the new friends he made. He enjoyed exploring the new country he now called home. 
and he loved how being outdoors reminded him of his childhood, of playing hopscotch and flying kites in the fields. It had been a long time since he felt this happy. More than anything, Foja loved the challenge. He had always enjoyed pushing his limits, whether it was learning to walk, doing farm work, or moving to a new country. Now he was ready for his next challenge. He started training with a coach, Harmander Singh, who had run many marathons and had trained others to run marathons too. There was no looking back after that. Harmander and Foja ran together many times a week. After months of hard work, 89-year-old Foja Singh became one of the oldest people to ever complete the 26.2-mile London Marathon. Foja ran the London Marathon five more times after that, getting faster each year and setting new records each time. By this point, Foja was famous. As people in England followed this man with a beard, turban, and disarming smile running great distances, they began to learn more about his sick background. Around this time, Foja learned that some people in the United States were attacking Sikhs for how they looked. Foja knew this was wrong and he wanted to help, but he wasn't sure how to share his message. He couldn't read, he couldn't write, he couldn't speak English, but he could run. And at once, Foja knew what he had to do. He decided to run the world's biggest marathon in New York City. By now, Foja was 93 years old. Could he still run 26.2 miles? Many news reporters didn't think so. But Foja did not listen and Foja did not stop. Every day he practiced with his coach. Every night he dreamed about running. And every morning he reminded himself of his mother's words. You know yourself, Foja, and you know what you're capable of. Today is a chance to do your best. The big race finally came on a chilly November day in 2003. Foja Singh stood at the start line. He felt ready knowing he had prepared as well as he could. He stretched in anticipation and recited a prayer, envisioning what it would feel like to cross the finish line. Just then, someone shouted racist and hateful words at him. Other people joined in. Foja brushed it off. He knew he had a strong spirit. He ran one foot in front of the other, and then disaster. The tender blisters on the soles of his feet had burst, and he was in a world of pain. He kept going, limping to the finish line. He made it, but it was his slowest time ever. Foja was so exhausted that he collapsed right after the race. Medics wanted to rush him into an ambulance and take him away to recover. But Foja preferred to stay and to recover in the company of his trainer and fellow runners. Foja made it back to England and for the first time in a long while, he was sad. Foja had wanted to run fast and show the world what six could achieve, but he felt like his poor performance at the world's biggest marathon made him look weak and that he had failed his six sisters and brothers all over the world. Maybe they were right, said a voice in his mind. Maybe it is too hard. Maybe you are too weak. The voice made Foja doubt himself for the first time in years, and it tried to convince him to quit running altogether. But Foja did not listen. Inspired by his coach, he set a new goal for himself. He was going to be the first 100-year-old person to ever run a full marathon. Foja ran every single day for years. He ran and ran. He practiced and practiced. He trained and trained. And when the day came, he knew he was ready. On October 16, 2011, 100-year-old Foja Singh lined up at the start of the Toronto Waterfront Marathon. He was so excited that it felt like an electric current was flowing through his body. He ran along the course and people joined him for a few miles at a time to show their support. He welcomed them with a smile, offering jokes to adults and high fives to children. As he ran, Foja thought about all the things people had said he would never do. They said he couldn't walk, but he did. They said he couldn't farm, but he did. They thought he was too old to run. And yet here he was running 26.2 miles at the age of 100. Foja had never been more sure of himself. He hoped that children and adults everywhere would see him take on this difficult challenge and persevere with grace, something he'd learned through his faith.
It took him eight hours, but he finally did it. Fo Jessing finished the Toronto Marathon and set a new world record as the oldest person to ever run a marathon. He stood tall, holding tightly to his medal with a proud smile on his face. He had faced many challenges in his 100 years, but Fo Jessing always kept going. That's the end. And then at the end of the book, there's a little bit on uh, Fo Jessing and his life. You know, this is a, a real shot of him and his, he was sponsored by Adidas. So he's in his Adidas getup. Uh, and these are his records on the, uh, on the final page of the book. I will stop sharing the screen here. So thank you all. Hope you, uh, hope you enjoyed it. And now I wanna invite my mom back into the conversation and ask her um, in reading this book, uh, what sticks out to her as, as the key takeaways and, and messages? Um, I'll say the message that resounds with me the most is the perseverance. So don't give up your dreams, follow your dreams, no matter what anybody says and what hardship comes in your way. And uh, just follow your dreams. And uh, also in this world, everybody is equal. So treat everybody nicely and equally. That's great. Thank you. I, I think um, for me, that's that's a big message that I take away from from Fo Jessing's life, and also I think um, so. So so yes to the to the message of, of perseverance and, and resilience. And, and when I was thinking about my own daughters in, in writing this book and, and thinking about what were the real uh, values that I wanted to instill in them, I, that that to me is is a really important one. Um, that life is not always easy. Uh, that challenges will come your way and, and what does it look like to keep going um, and so to see someone have these incredible life challenges um, that deal with all sorts of um, all sorts of things that we don't often talk about um, in, in our homes with young children right disability um, death uh, racism like these are these are real life things and so what does it look like for us to introduce these ideas to our kids at a younger age. I mean, one of the things I remember at Trinity when I was teaching there uh, was realizing that a lot of, a lot of my students um, were coming in as, as adults, right? They're 18 years old when they start. Um, and it's for many of them, the first time that they're being exposed to different cultures and different ways of living. Um, and, and, you know, I, I loved being the person who gets to do that uh, because it's so rewarding, but also, <laughs> It's, it's, it's really scary to think about the fact that we don't teach our kids about this kind of life skill, right? Of seeing the humanity and people who are different from us until they're adults. It's, it's too late at that point, right? We have to start a lot earlier. And that's, that's something that really came out of my experience uh, there at Trinity that, that, I've, that I've really held on to, uh, this conviction that we have to start earlier with our kids. Um, and, then, and then the other point around... Um, seeing the seeing the humanity in everyone that, that my mom was mentioning it's it's a it's a close parallel and, and again this is coming from personal experience but to be on the other side of dehumanization um you know it, it's there's something about that experience that 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 requires you to cultivate res resilience um right like in for jessing's case um he learned over time that he couldn't uh he couldn't rely on other people's perceptions to feel like he was a valuable person deserving of dignity and respect right like so much of our culture tells us that we have to that we have to seek external validation uh to make ourselves feel like we have value and, and what we see in Floyd Jessing's story and I felt this myself uh, uh through the racialization I've endured um is that it has to come from within and that's something I really want our kids to recognize as well and, and the last thing um, in, in terms of, you know, what, what I gained from Bo Jessing's story um, is the opportunity to connect with people whose experiences I don't have, right? And, and while I may, um, while I may sh share the same uh, ethnic and religious background as Bo Jessing, um, you know, I personally have never dealt with disability. I've never dealt with uh, ageism. And so to step into his shoes through a story, right? And this is true for kids and it's true for adults, but to be able to connect with someone uh, and see their humanity um, 
it, it helps us challenge some of the negative messages that we've all sort of received throughout our lives, right? Like around ableism and ageism and xenophobia and racism and all these things that, you know, classism that, that come up in through Flo Jessing's life. And so um, those have been really exciting for me. So let me, let me just say, what's, what's the, what's the call to action? I mean, the, the, the obvious one is to buy the book and share it with those you love. Um, I think it's, I think it's a beautiful for adjusting story. It's a beautiful story. Um, and it actually does some significant work in, in helping us open up conversations with our kids. Um, but more important than that, I, I think the, the big call to action for me is that we have to, and we should be more intentional about diversifying the stories we pay attention to and the people we pay attention to. And so um, I would love it if you all would try to actively connect uh, with these stories and with the people who are unfamiliar to you. Uh, and that, you know, be, because we all have such distinct identities, right, that's not going to look the same for all of us. But it's such a powerful experience uh, to do that, uh, to open up our hearts and minds uh, and help us overcome some of the biases that exist within our own beings. So that's, that's what I would really love for everyone to try and do. That's, that's the sort of impulse that's driving the, the creation of this book and, and all the work that I do um, in the classroom and outside of it for, for justice and equity. Um, so, so I would appreciate anybody who's, who's interested in joining along for the ride. So thank you all for joining today. Um, really, really appreciate you. And, um, and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Bye, everyone.